Magic the Gathering is an amazing and rich strategy game, but with all that complexity, it can feel a little daunting to get into the game. So what I did is I worked with ProGuides.com to create a very basic intro tutorial to help you get to your first game of Magic the Gathering. Now, the video you're about to see is the last video in the series. It's one where we walk through a game of Magic talking about all the concepts we learned in the first eight videos. Where are those located? You can get them all for free over at ProGuides.com. Again, this is to help show you the rules and get you into the first game. There's also a series at ProGuides.com that is an introduction to the basic strategy of Magic the Gathering too. So go there to check out the rest of the series. And until then, I hope you enjoyed this video. Okay, so we've learned a whole bunch of rules about how resources, lands work. We've talked about spells like creatures and instants and sorceries. Let's take everything that we've learned and then just watch a game of magic so we can see everything tie together. The point of watching this game is so that you understand what is going on. We're not going to focus as much on why, what the strategy is. This is to make sure you have a grounding in how magic is played. Okay, so what do we see on screen? We see our hand of seven cards at the bottom. In the bottom left, you'll see this pile of cards. That's our deck. If we go to the opposite end in the top right, we see our opponent's deck of cards. And our opponent on the other side has seven cards of their own. We also note that 20 that is on the top and the bottom is our starting life total and our opponent's starting life total. So as we let this game begin, What's the first thing we're going to do? Well, we're going to play an island. That is the blue resource generator. We don't have any spells that cost one, so there's really nothing to do, so we pass the turn. All right, on our second turn, we play another island, and if we look at the cost of our cards, we can't cast any of these yet, so we're just passing the turn. All right, our opponent plays the first spell of the game. It's called Thought Erasure. Now, it's important that you don't try to memorize too many cards in Magic. All you ever have to do is read the text that's on the card, and it'll tell you what's going on. They want to discard, and it looks like our opponent has chosen this spell, Cancel. Again, I don't want you to worry too much about what Cancel does. We don't get to cast it anymore. And we see down in the bottom left, Cancel is there in our graveyard. Any card that's discarded, any creature that dies, any of them go down there to the bottom left in that graveyard. The next thing that Thought Erasure allows our opponent to do is something called Surveil 1. Surveil says you look at the top card of your library and you get to choose whether to leave it there or put it in the graveyard. So it looks like our opponent is going to do that. And now it's our turn. All right, it's turn three. We're going to play another island because we're allowed to play one land per turn, and it's time for us to cast our very first spell. There's a few things that are going to happen here. First, notice that these three islands get turned sideways a little bit. That's tapping. These islands are being used to generate one blue mana each this turn. In total, that's three, and that lets us cast our Avon Wind Mage. Now that it's out, Let's read this Avon Wind Mage. It's the first creature of the game, and we're interested in kind of what are its properties? What does it do? Well, as you might imagine, given that it is a bird wizard, this creature has flying, and flying creatures can only be blocked by other creatures with flying, or other creatures that specifically say they're allowed to block flyers. Also, this Avon Wind Mage reads, Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Avon Wind Mage gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. This is where I'm going to start talking about the colors. Blue typically has a lot of instant and sorcery spells. This is why the Avon Wind Mage is nice in blue decks, because it can benefit from that a little bit. Since we have no more lands that are untapped, that means we can't make any more mana. Our turn is done and it's back over. To Merlu. Merlu plays another of these dual lands that can generate two different types of mana, and oof, our opponent casts Cast Down. Cast Down is a very simple spell. Destroy target non-legendary creature. As much as we love our wee little Avon Wind Mage, he's not legendary, so he dies, and you'll see down in the bottom left, 
Avon Wind Mage goes to the graveyard. It's now our fourth turn. We're going to play a fourth island. We can cast this Exclusion Mage, and this is kind of an interesting decision. Exclusion Mage says, When Exclusion Mage enters the battlefield, return target creature in opponent controls to its owner's hand. So for instance, if Mare Lu had a large threatening creature that was out on the battlefield, Exclusion Mage could send that creature back and we would get to deal with it later on. We wouldn't have to deal with it now. It would just be sent right back to the hand. Mare Lu would of course be able to recast that on a later turn. But as we look at the battlefield, there's nothing there. When the Exclusion Mage comes out, what we would say is that the Exclusion Mage has no legal targets. There's no creature there. So what do we do? Nothing happens. If there's no target, it just doesn't go off. So really all that's happened is we have played a creature that is a 2-2, two -two, and that's it. On our opponent's fourth turn, our opponent plays Fell Spectre, which has a number of properties on it. First, it's flying. Second of all, it says whenever Fell Spectre enters the battlefield, target player discards a card. And that third, perhaps most important aspect, is that whenever an opponent discards a card, Fell Spectre will deal two damage to that player. So the Fell Spectre comes down, we have to discard a card. We don't want to discard one of our good cards. We're going to choose to discard an island. Immediately, we take two damage. It's now our turn five. We don't have a lot of cards in hand, but the card that we are going to be able to cast is Tezzeret Artifice Master. This is a Planeswalker. Planeswalkers have their own special place on the battlefield, off to the bottom right, as we see. And once a turn, Tezzeret can do one of three abilities, provided that Tezzeret has enough loyalty to cast them. We see that Tezzeret enters the battlefield with five loyalty. So let's look at the three abilities that Tezzeret can do. First, the ability that gives Tezzeret plus one loyalty says, create a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. This means that Tezzeret generates 1-1 one, one flyers once a turn. A single 1-1 one, one flyer is not that much, but if Tezzeret stays alive for many turns in a row, we'll be able to amass a huge army of 1-1 one, one colorless flying thopters. Tezzeret's middle ability, this zero ability, won't change Tezzeret's loyalty at all. And it says draw a card. If you control three or more artifacts, draw two cards instead. Let's notice a little synergy here. Tezzeret's plus one says create a 1-1 one, one colorless thopter artifact creature token. So Tezzeret can create a bunch of flying artifact creatures for three turns. And then Tezzeret can benefit from that after there's three artifact flyers out in order for this zero ability to draw two cards instead. Tezzeret's minus nine ability is pretty insane. We are not allowed to cast Tezzeret's minus nine ability until Tezzeret has nine or more loyalty. So we're going to have to do that plus one for a number of turns. But the minus nine reads, you get an emblem with, at the beginning of your end step, search your library for a permanent card, then put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. In other words, if we get that minus nine off, we get to put any permanent from our deck on the battlefield for free every single turn. Generally, if any planeswalker gets to cast their ultimate ability, that can pretty much be GG, good game, game's over right there. In order to march our way to that minus nine ability, and because having one one thopters is pretty good, we're gonna go ahead and use Tezzeret's plus one ability. That's the only ability that we can do this turn. We're allowed to do one ability per turn with our planeswalker. So a thopter is created and the turn is passed back to Mare Lu. On Merlu's turn, Merlu casts a second cast down, killing our exclusion mage. Black, in addition to discarding, as I said before, is basically really good at death and destruction, so there's a lot of black spells that kill creatures. Oof, such as this one, Fungal Infection. Fungal Infection reads, target creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. 
Look at our poor little thopter. It's a 1-1. One, one. When it gets minus 1, minus 1, that means that 1 power gets subtracted down to 0. That 1 toughness gets subtracted down to 0 too. And if a creature ever has 0 toughness, it is dead. So now our little thopter dies and goes away. The Fungal Infection also allows the caster to summon a 1-1 one, one Sapperling, which we now see on the other side of the battlefield. This is a pretty bad turn for us. The Fell Spectre can now choose to attack us, which would bring our health from 18 down to 17. We have no way of stopping it. We have no way of blocking it, period. But the Fell Spectre instead chooses to attack Tezzeret. See how Tezzeret has six loyalty? Boom! That one damage drops the loyalty back down to five. So we are in a bit of a pickle, but we have a lot of options still going strong. First of all, Tezzeret is not dead. Tezzeret is going to easily generate another 1-1 one, one Thopter. Still plenty of loyalty left on Tezzeret to keep Tezzeret alive. And we have this very nice card in our hand called Divination. One of the big strengths of blue as a color is blue is really good at drawing cards. Divination is a super simple spell. Draw two cards. This is going to give us some more options to hopefully start getting back into this game. We draw a Salvager of Secrets, which is too expensive to cast, so we're not going to look at that right now, but we have two of these cards called Essence Scatter. Essence Scatter says Counter Target Creature Spell. Now you might be wondering exactly how that works. Well, don't worry, we only have to wait one turn to find out what happens. So a few things are going to happen now that we're going to go through one at a time. First, Merlu casts their own Exclusion Mage. As we talked about, the Exclusion Mage doesn't immediately land on the battlefield. It moves off to the right. It's on the stack. This is an opportunity for us to do something. The second thing I want you to see is that there's two islands that are untapped. And if we have an instant spell, we can cast that instant on Merlu's turn. We do have an instant. It's Essence Scatter. So let's look at visually what winds up happening. We're going to spend our two available islands to make two mana to cast our Essence Scatter. That Essence Scatter gets laid on top of the Exclusion Mage on the stack. In what order do things happen on the stack? Top down. You see it visually displayed right there on the screen. Essence Scatter says counter target creature spell, and we see the Exclusion Mage dissipate and go to the graveyard before ever landing on the battlefield. That means that we have successfully countered a spell. All right, it's time for some combat. Merlu doesn't cast any more spells, but instead chooses to attack Tezzeret. Now remember, the order of combat is Merlu declares attackers, then it's time for us to declare blockers. Let's think about what our options are. We have one Thopter. It could block either the Fell Spectre or the Sapperling. If the Thopter blocks the Sapperling, what happens? Well, damage happens at the same time, so they'll both deal one damage to each other. They both have one toughness, so they both would die. This is called a trade. You lost a thing, I lost a thing. I also could have my 1-1 one, one Thopter block the Fell Spectre. What would happen? The Fell Spectre would deal one damage to the Thopter. The Thopter would deal one damage to the Spectre. But because the Spectre has three toughness, the Fell Spectre would live. And we would lose our Thopter. This is called bad. You really don't want to just chump your little dudes in front of enemy creatures for nothing. You want to at least gain something. You'd at least like to trade. And that is exactly what happens. Merlu, who's attacking the Tezzeret, gets blocked by this 1-1 one, one Thopter. The 1-1 one, one Thopter and the Sapperling trade, and combat is now finished. And we just drew an excellent card. We just drew the Djinn of Wishes. We first responsibly ask our Tezzeret to do the plus one loyalty ability to make a Thopter. Then we cast the Gin of Wishes, which uses up all of our mana. Let's take a look at Gin of Wishes. First of all, it's a very large creature. It is a 4-4. This is much larger than any other creature we've had on the battlefield yet. 
We've had 1-1s one and 1-3s and 2-2s, two but this is a 4-4. Four four. Jinn of Wishes also is a flyer. So these fell specters that are attacking in the air, this Jinn of Wishes can easily block them. And remember what we just talked about with trading or making bad blocks? If a fell specter, a 1-3, fought against a Jinn of Wishes, a 4-4, four four, the Jinn of Wishes would live and the fell specter would die. And that would be bad for Mare Lu. Let's read the rest of this Jinn of Wishes card. It says that it enters the battlefield with three wish counters on it. Then we can choose to pay two blue and two colorless, that's a total of four mana, to remove a wish counter and look at the top card of our library. We can then cast that card without paying its mana cost. So Jinn of Wishes can let us peek at the top and if we make a good wish, we can cast one of our biggest, baddest spells for free. The only thing we had to pay was this four mana cost on the Gin of Wishes and remove a wish counter from it. So the Gin of Wishes can do that up to three times. We'll wind up seeing that Gin's ability used a lot later, but for now, the Gin of Wishes is just a big old 4-4 four, four flyer. All five of our islands are tapped. We have no ability to cast anything else. We've used our one Planeswalker ability for the turn, and so we're going to pass the turn back to Merlu. On Merlu's turn, Merlu casts a second Fell Spectre. Again, it's a 1-3 flyer. Again, it's going to make us discard a card, and it looks like we're going to choose to discard the Essence Capture. Whether that's the right or the wrong choice, don't worry about it. Just note that we do have to discard one, so we chuck the Essence Scatter into the graveyard. But that final line of text on Fell Spectre says... Whenever an opponent discards a card, Fell Spectre deals two damage to that player. Merlu has two Fell Spectres out, so both of them are going to deal two damage to us. So that's a total of four damage. As you can see, the Fell Spectre is not a particularly intimidating creature on its own. It's just a little old 1-3. It can't deal that much damage alone. But black as a color makes enemies discard lots of cards, so the Fell Spectre could possibly wind up just murdering us through lots of repeated discards, and the Fell Spectres triggering their two damage over and over again. Now that it's our turn again, we'll note that Tezzeret is going to use that plus one, make another Thopter. Tezzeret is now at seven loyalty. After two more turns, Tezzeret will be at nine and might have a chance to cast that ultimate ability. We're also going to play with our five islands. We're going to tap all of them and play Salvager of Secrets, which lets us look into our graveyard, choose an instant or sorcery that was in the graveyard, and put it right back into the hand. We can see the graveyard sort of splashed out visually, and we get to choose a card. We're going to choose Divination. Divination is a card that lets us draw more cards. As we can see, Merlu doesn't have that many cards in hand. We don't have that many cards in hand. So it would be nice for us to fill up and wind up with more options than our opponent. On Merlu's turn, Merlu plays a Thief of Sanity. It's got a lot of card text on it, which can sometimes be a little intimidating. But let's just walk through this, and then let's conceptually think about how the Thief of Sanity works. First of all, Thief of Sanity is a 2-2 flyer. It's not terribly big. But in this big paragraph of text, it says, whenever Thief of Sanity deals combat damage to a player. Now, again, what is that? That's Thief of Sanity attacking us, not blocking, and then the Thief of Sanity dealing its two damage to us. If that Thief of Sanity deals combat damage to a player, look at the top three cards of that player's library. Exile one of them face down and put the rest into their graveyard. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may look at it, you may cast it, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. What effectively is Thief of Sanity doing? It's stealing cards from the enemy deck. If Merlu's Thief of Sanity hits us, Merlu gets to look at the top three cards of our deck, pick one of them, slide it down, face down, and then cast that. It doesn't matter if that card costs four red mana, and Merlu, as you can see, only has black and blue mana. Merlu could tap any four land to generate any four mana and cast that card that was exiled. 
Thief of Sanity is a really scary card in a lot of circumstances. But all that stealing of cards from our deck and getting to cast them is really hard for Merlu to do. Why? We have a Gin of Wishes. We have a 4-4 Flyer, and Thief of Sanity is only a 2-2. If the Thief of Sanity were to attack, then this 4-4 Flyer would block it, the 4-4 would easily destroy the 2-2, and we would be fine. So this Thief of Sanity can be really scary if we don't have any flying defense, and we have tons of flying defense. Even if our Jin died, we got a bunch of Thopters here too. So, Thief of Sanity, a really cool, complicated card with a ton of power, is not really going to be that much threat against us. So right as we're feeling nice and safe, we comfortably defend against all these flyers with our big gin wall, Merlu plays a second Thought Erasure. Ugh! Thought Erasure is going to look at our hand. Since there's only one spell in our hand, we immediately have to discard that. Merlu then gets to Surveil 1, which as you'll remember is look at the top card of your library, either leave it there or put it in the graveyard. And remember those two Fell Spectres? Well, looks like we just discarded a card, so each of those Fell Spectres gets to ping us in the face for two damage each, and we tumble down to ten. But now Merlu does something that I don't know is a good attack. Merlu asks both Fell Spectres to attack Tezzeret. Okay, it's our turn to block. Looks like Merlu is very concerned about Tezzeret getting to that minus nine. What do we do? Well, we have one Thopter block the Fell Spectre, that means the Thopter will die. But we also have our Gin of Wishes block the other Fell Spectre. Our Gin of Wishes easily kills that enemy Fell Spectre. All we lost was a Thopter, and Tezzeret is still slowly increasing in loyalty. On our turn, we're gonna again use the plus one for Tezzeret. Tezzeret is now at eight loyalty, is so close to that minus nine. And we're also gonna use that Gin of Wishes, wishful ability of looking at the top of the deck. We pay four mana to do that, and it looks like we only see an island. Eh, not the best, but what are you gonna do? Sometimes your wishes don't come true. And it's time for us to go to combat. The Fell Spectre that attacked is still tapped, so that Fell Spectre can't block. We could attack with our Gin of Wishes, but we want to make sure we have the Gin alive for defense. This will prevent the Thief of Sanity from attacking. This will prevent the Fell Spectre from attacking. So all we choose to attack with is this small Salvager of Secrets, a 2-2. If the Thief of Sanity blocked that 2-2, well, they would both die, and we're super happy with that. Thieves of Sanity can be so difficult to deal with. On Merlu's turn, Merlu plays, oh my gosh, another Fell Spectre. That's three this game. So we have fallen to six health. We're getting real close to death, but we're hanging on in there. It's our turn again. The usual untapped lands draw a card happen. Tezzeret is going to use the plus one ability again to bring Tezzeret to nine total loyalty. That means next turn we get to cast Tezzeret's minus nine ultimate. Yeah! With the six islands in the battlefield and the one island in our hand, we're gonna have seven mana total that we can generate this turn, which is enough to both play this three mana Aven Wind Mage and also cast the Jin's Wish ability. So let's go ahead and do the Jin of Wishes ability first. We look at the top card and, <laughs> well, it's a counter spell. Uh, since no spell is being cast right now, uh, we can't really do anything with it, so uh, as a little bit of a dud. That's all right. We're just going to play the island from our hand. We're going to play the Avon Wind Mage. We have no more cards left in hand, and it's time for combat. Now, in this combat, we're going to swing with the Salvager of Secrets all by its lonely self. Why is this attack a bad attack? At first glance, this seems fine. If the Salvager of Secrets is blocked by the Thief of Sanity, well then both will die in combat damage. If the Salvager of Secrets is blocked by a Fell Spectre, well, the Salvager would deal two to the Fell Spectre, the Fell Spectre would deal one to the Salvager of Secrets, and both of them would survive, because neither of them would have dealt more damage than the other's toughness. But, Merlu can double block 
the Salvager of Secrets. Merlu can have one Fell Spectre block the Salvager of Secrets and have the second Fell Spectre block the Salvager of Secrets. Those two combined Fell Spectres would deal two damage to the Salvager of Secrets. The Salvager of Secrets could deal two damage however it wanted, two to one of them, or one damage to each. It doesn't matter. However, we would decide to distribute that damage. We wouldn't kill a single Fell Spectre. So the question is, does Merlu see that this double block will get him a free Salvager of Secrets? As it turns out, the answer is no. So it looks like we got a little bit lucky. Merlu made a little bit of a mistake there. Either way, this is the interesting and difficult part of magic. There are a lot of combinations. There are a lot of options. You're going to miss possibilities when you attack. You're going to miss good blocks when you defend. But you're also going to have the opportunity to make some really sweet plays as well. Nobody is perfect when they're playing this game. On Merlu's turn, Merlu doesn't do anything. You'll wind up in this situation with some frequency in magic. It doesn't look like there's any good attacks to make. You don't really want to cast the spell in your hand yet. No big deal, just pass the turn. Now that it's our turn again, I am so thrilled to say that we get to cast Tezzeret's minus nine. What this means is that at the end of every turn we have, we get to look through our entire deck and take any permanent out of it and slam it on the battlefield without paying any of its cost. We could summon huge creatures, we could summon planeswalkers, we could summon enchantments, and one of those is going to be coming down every single turn. We're pretty close to death at 6 health, but if we get a few more turns, this Tezzeret minus 9 emblem is going to give us so much power. We've also drawn a fantastic card in this situation. A 4 mana spell called Bone to Ash. One thing to note though, Gin of Wish's ability costs 4 mana, Bone to Ash costs 4 mana, but we only have 7 islands out. So we can only do one or the other. So what we're going to do is we love making wishes. We're going to use the last wish counter on that Gin of Wishes, pay 4 mana, and look at the top card. Okay, it's an island. We're going to play the island, which means we have 4 available mana again, so we will be able to cast our Bone to Ash. With the Avon Wind Mage out and our three Thopters, we have lots of defense against the Thief of Sanity, lots of defense against the Fell Spectres. So we are now going to attack with that Gin of Wishes. Now normally, now that combat is done, our turn would be over and we would just pass it right back to Merlu. But remember, there's that emblem. So we get to look through our entire deck, put anything back out, and... <laughs> well... We used to have a Tezzeret and it felt pretty good, so why don't we just pull out another Tezzeret and put that on the field? You can only have one Tezzeret out at a time because Tezzeret is a legendary, but uh, since our old Tezzeret minus nine himself into this emblem, uh, there's nothing wrong with casting this Tezzeret now. After some long, hard thought, Merlu casts Ergaros, the Empty One, a six mana, four, three flyer. It says whenever Ergaros, the Empty One, deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card at random. If that player can't, you draw a card. Ooh, this one is nasty, especially with those two fell specters still on the battlefield for Merlu. And you know what's awesome? Ergaros doesn't enter the battlefield immediately. Ergaros goes on the stack, and we get the chance to cast a spell. And you know what spell we're going to cast? Bone to Ash. All that fancy text on Ergaros, never going to see the light of day. Bone to Ash counters the spell. Ergaros goes to the graveyard. Bone to Ash lets us draw another card, and things are looking better and better for us. You may have noticed that when we cast Bone to Ash, immediately something else flashed up on the screen to the top of the stack. What was that? Well, remember we have an Avon Wind Mage that says whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, our Wind Mage gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. That triggered ability also goes on the stack. You'll see it lands on the top, and how do we resolve the stack? Top down. First, that plus one, plus one is going to happen. We now see that on the Avon Wind Mage. You can see its uh, power and toughness is in blue, just to let you know that it's being affected. 
Bone to Ash happens, countering Urgros, and now the stack is empty. Now that it's our turn again, we're going to do the zero ability for Tezzeret. It's zero because it doesn't change Tezzeret's loyalty up or down when used. And this is the one that lets us draw a card unless we control three artifacts. You see those three 1-1 one, one Thopters? Those are the three artifacts, so we get to draw two cards. One of them that we draw is Divination, which lets us draw two more cards. Well, the more the merrier, so may as well spend three of our mana to cast this. After all our card drawing is done, we have a pair of creatures we can cast. The first one we're going to play is Exclusion Mage, which, if you'll recall, lets us target an enemy creature and return that to our opponent's hand. We don't want to return a Fell Spectre to our opponent's hand. If that were the case, then on Merlu's next turn, Merlu would replay that Fell Spectre, making us discard another card which would then trigger both the Fell Spectre's two damage ability. Uh, that just sounds terrible. We're not going to do that. We're going to return the Thief of Sanity back to Merlu's hand. Why? Uh, may as well. I mean, it is going to return something to the opponent's hand, so let's go ahead and just return this Thief of Sanity instead of the Fell Spectre. We also have an Aviation Pioneer, which is a 1-2, a very, very tiny creature. But the Aviation Pioneer also, upon entering the battlefield, creates another 1-1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. The exact same as the three Thopters we already have. At this point, we go to combat. We have some pretty good attackers we can swing with. The Avon Wind Mage. Normally a 2-2 is a 3-3, because remember, we started this turn off by casting Divination. Merlu does not really have a good block for either of those. Technically, Merlu could put the Fell Spectre in front of one of them, and it would immediately die and prevent a little bit of damage. It looks like Merlu is not yet going to put the Fell Spectre in the way. So Merlu falls to seven, and oh boy, remember that Tezzeret emblem? Well, yeah, it's still there, so we still get to choose another permanent and put it onto the battlefield. What is it going to be? Ooh, how about Patient Rebuilding? This is an enchantment that says, at the beginning of your upkeep, remember your upkeep is just the start of your turn, at the beginning of your upkeep, target opponent puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. Then, you draw a card for each land card put into that graveyard this way. Because Patient Rebuilding is an enchantment, it's a permanent, it stays there. So every single turn at the start of our turn, we could potentially be drawing more and more and more cards. Hence the name, Patient Rebuilding. So if we just take a snapshot of what the world looks like right now, we have a ton of Thopters, we have five other creatures, we have a Tezzeret that can draw us more cards and generate more Thopters, we have this Patient Rebuilding enchantment that could let us draw even more cards at the start of our turn, and let's not forget the Tezzeret emblem, which is the symbol at the far left side of the screen that's letting us peel a permanent out of our library at the end of every turn. We have so much momentum right now, but we are at six life. That's still pretty low, and ooh, Merlu casts Raider's Wake. Raider's Wake is also an enchantment, and it says whenever an opponent discards a card, that player loses two life. Now, if we stop right now and just look at the situation we're in, if Merlu can cast one more discard spell, and we have to discard one more card, Raider's Wake will deal two damage, Fell Spectre number one will deal two damage, Fell Spectre number two will deal two damage, that's six damage, we would die. There's another ability on Raider's Wake that says Raid. At the beginning of your end step, if you attacked with a creature this turn, target opponent discards a card. So here comes Merlu attacking with both those Fell Spectres. If we get to end of turn, Raider's Wake will cause us to discard a card because it's triggered by the Fell Spectres attacking. This is a super important block right now. We have to triple block this Fell Spectre. Whoa, what does that mean? Why? Well, each of our defenders who are flying can block one of those Fell Spectres, which are flying. So we can have three of our Thopters block one of those Fell Spectres. Each Thopter deals one damage to the Fell Spectre for a total of three. The Fell Spectre deals one damage back to one of those three Thopters, killing one of the Thopters. And very, very importantly, 
watch us get to the end of the turn? Well, at end of turn, that's when Raider's Wake forces us to discard a card. We do discard a card, but because one of the Fell Spectres was just killed in combat, whew, what a relief. We only take four damage, so we still live at two health. Now that it's our turn again, Merlu has no creatures to block with, has only two lands that have not been tapped, so that's only two mana available to cast a spell. We're drawing bonus cards with Tezzeret, we're drawing bonus cards with Patient Rebuilding, and we have an army ready to attack that cannot be blocked. Merlu concedes before we make that attack, but literally if we made it to that combat step, that would be good game. 